All right, guys, welcome. I hope you're having a beautiful summer. You're ready to get back to work. We're going to go ahead and get started. All right, so we are going to be talking about extension filers and how do you get these type of clients? How can you really increase your tax base by going after this specific niche? So today we're going to talk about one, of course, the introduction about extension filers, who they are, identifying your target market marketing strategies to secure last minute clients, closing the deal, converting leads to clients, and then some best practices for managing your last minute clients are going to be coming through. I really got this idea because Tony, one of our members, posted in our Slack channel that he has 150 extensions that he has to file. And Tony has a a bigger practice, I believe, last time I spoke to him. I think he said he has over 700 clients. So it makes sense that 10, 20% of those clients would need to file an extension. And so it got me to thinking like, oh man, I wonder if more people are being intentional. And what I mean by people, I mean that tax professionals, right? I wonder if tax pros are being more intentional about attracting extension filers. So one, I believe it is a unique and often overlooked segment of the tax preparation market. I haven't personally spoken too much about this specific segment of the market. They are individuals and businesses that file extensions for their taxes. And we're going to go over some reasons on why they might have filed an extension. Now, for tax professionals, I believe that this is a huge opportunity for you guys to go out, attract these types of clients. One, help them in a time where they actually need it, because if they file an extension, you got to think about the type of mindset that they were in to even file an extension. And then you got to think about the mindset that they're in as the extension deadline is approaching. So this is a great way to build a lot of goodwill with these types of clients so that you can translate them into additional service clients and then ongoing tax preparation clients. So let's talk about understanding extension file. So while we already talked about that, they are both individuals and businesses. So this is the beautiful part is that even if you aren't going after business clients yet, you could just focus on individual extensions. But if you're like me, you want to go after both. I highly encourage you to do both, to go after the businesses as well as the individuals. And then oftentimes you guys know when you go after the business, you often pick up the individual tax return too. And it's not uncommon for uh, the business needed to file an extension. The individual probably needed to file an extension as well, their individual side. Why would that be? But yeah, think about it. If you have a client that's a partnership, for example, that's a flow through, pass through entity, same with the S corporation. So if they had to file an extension for their S corp or their partnership, they need that K-1 schedule to file their individual tax return. So unfortunately, they probably filed, or fortunately for you, they probably filed an extension for both. So you can pick up both when you strategically go after the business clients. Now, we know partnerships and S-Corps, if they are on a calendar year, that their extension deadline is September 15th because their initial filing deadline is March 15th. If they are a corporation, their original deadline, if they were on a calendar year, is April 15th. So their extension deadline is October 15th. So we are currently August 20th. So it's a beautiful time. You guys have 30 days and 60 days, respectively, to go after both entity types to start your marketing and really get these types of clients in the door. And then, of course, like I said, pick up their individual tax return. Now, let's talk about why these individuals and businesses file extension to begin with. One, incomplete documentation. So taxpayers, typically, we're all waiting on W-2s and 1099s or K-1s. We need all of our tax documents in order to file an accurate tax return. So a lot of people, you would know that the reason why they have to file an extension is simply because of that. They don't have all the necessary documentation that they need to file a complete and accurate return. Now, some cases might be a little nuanced, right? So I remember uh, years ago when I, the first and last time I went to H&R Block to get my taxes done, I wanted to apply for, or she told me that I qualified for the college, the American Opportunity Tax Credit, because I was in university at the time. 
And she said, I need your 1098T form. Right from the beginning, she needed that and I didn't have it. So she was like, you know what we, what we can do? We can file your taxes now. And then when you get your 1098T form, you can just bring it back and I'll do an amendment. So this is what she proposed to me. So I said, okay, because I needed my money. She was going to give me some sort of cash advance, right? That's how they get you. <laughs> so I got my cash advance. She filed my initial tax return. And then a week or so later, I came back and I filed my extension with the 1098T. Now, you might have clients like that who filed an initial return with a tax professional and maybe they missed documentation or they missed certain credits or deductions on their tax return and now they actually need to do an amendment. So this can be like a little one-off additional strategy that you can go after people that might need to do amendments for their tax return. Complex tax situations. So some filers, they have complicated tax situations. So this will involve if they have multiple streams of income, foreign income, numerous deductions and credits, this typically requires a lot more time. So they probably would have filed an extension to give them more time to gather all of their documents and deductions and credits in order to file their taxes properly. You have life events. So your taxpayer, whether individual or business, they might have gone through a divorce, birth of a child, moving to a new state. This can obviously complicate tax preparation, which would promote them needing more time. My favorite one on why most people file an extension is procrastination. So simply put, some filers, they delay starting their tax preparation until the very last minute. I don't know how many times I've had dozens of people come to me on April 15th. You guys probably, so you can type in the chat and let me know if you experience this too every year. Come to me at the last minute on April 15th, email, my phone is going off, text messages going off. People are like, I need you to file an extension or I need you to file my taxes ASAP. And so a lot of times people hitting you up at the last minute, you naturally have to file an extension for them so that they are at least compliant with the tax filing deadline. And so this is a big one, just helping your clients not procrastinate giving them the, those reminders well before the filing deadline. But unfortunately, you've probably already got a set of those. And it's already a nice set of people that already filed an extension who unfortunately pro procrastinated. And then you have these kind of other nuances where, of course, they just need more help. You might have had people that were trying to prepare their taxes themselves on TurboTax. And they were like, oh, no, this is way more complicated than what I thought. They file an extension and now they are actually looking for a tax professional to finish the filing process for them. And then the last one is cash flow issues. It has to be said, especially if you're going after businesses, that sometimes they don't file because they don't have the money to file. They know that they can't do it themselves and they typically don't have the funds to pay most tax returns. Most professionals now are charging, thank goodness their value. So they're probably charging at least $1,000 or more for business tax prep or around that area, right? 750, 850 and up. And so some businesses might put it off because of cash flow issues. So you can reach out and incorporate all of these different filing situations on why they needed to file an extension. Incorporate this language into your marketing strategies. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. All right. So now we need to talk about the mindset. This is perfectly tying into the marketing, right? So again, if you know why people file an extension, we can strategically target them using this verbiage, using these ways and reasons in these mindsets and use this in our marketing so that we can attract these type of clients. So we already know that if they did file an extension, they probably were overwhelmed, right? This led them, the individual and the business to delay starting the process. Maybe they fear making any mistakes on their tax return that could potentially trigger an audit. So there's quite a few, and I was surprised by this, but there's quite a few business owners that are afraid of an audit and they don't file or they file not to their best interest. And you guys, let me know if you experienced this where you might have some business owners they don't want to put certain legitimate deductions on their tax return because they're afraid that it might trigger an audit for them. So this kind of like fear is a part of that mindset. Perfectionism, right? So some taxpayers, they hold off on filing because they want to ensure everything is perfect and they get paralyzed by analyzing too much. 
competing priorities. Of course, we're dealing with business owners and professionals. They probably have demanding careers and they tend to push the tax filing process down on their priority list. And then simply you just have people that avoid it because they expect to owe money. How many of you guys have dealt with individuals and businesses? They're like, oh man, I'm going to owe. So let me just put this off as long as I can. So if you understand like the psychology of the extension filer, you want to use this in your marketing strategy. You want to talk about these things, how they were overwhelmed, how they're afraid of being audited, how they're afraid that they might use this language in your marketing strategies to attract them and to call attention to your services. So in talking about this, you want to position yourself as a solution to their problem, right? So we need to position you as the person that's going to alleviate their overwhelm, right? You're coming in, you're going to save the day. You're going to help them meet their filing deadline. You're going to highlight the consequences of missing the deadline. So this is where you can make posts and videos about the penalties and interest that could potentially face if they don't file on time. This can help just give them that extra sense of urgency that can motivate them to act quickly and engage in your services. You could create some limited time offers, right? So use this sparingly, but you can create special promos, discounts, or any added value services. We'll talk about like how you can bundle up some services toward the end. But this could be, I would say, something that would be enticing for them to come to you rather than go back to maybe the person that actually filed their extension. If you have some sort of special promo or bundled offer to help you stand apart. Use targeted messaging, right? So again, talk about the audits and the need for perfectionism, right? The need to not make a mistake. Talk about how time is running out and how they don't want to risk having any penalties. When you use these targeted messaging on LinkedIn, right? Maybe you create a LinkedIn article and you talk about filing an extension or did you file an extension because you were overwhelmed or did you procrastinate and file an extension, right? And talk about all of these different points in a LinkedIn article and then take that article and maybe do a video about it, right? And then take that video and then splice it up and pop up some TikTok reels or some Instagram reels. This is how you can incorporate your marketing messaging and the psychology of the extension into your marketing messaging. All right, so let's talk about the benefits of working with extension filers. One, higher fees for exp for expedited service. So you could, in essence, due to the sensitive nature of their needs, extension but often willing to pay premium fees for a quick turnaround and expert handling. So you can significantly increase your revenue during the extension period by bumping up your prices a little bit because this is last minute and you're trying to get them in. This could be a strategy. On the flip side, going back to the promo side, you might wanna do the reverse of this and offer a bundled service offering so you can get them in the door. And then by getting them in the door, you can offer complimentary services like bookkeeping. You can obviously get them for next following season, which is coming up very soon in a couple of months. So there's two different strategies that you can deploy. There's no right or wrong. I say just try it. I am all about testing what works and just testing how people respond to different offers. Again, you could build trust for future engagement. So going after these last minute followers, you are building strong trust and loyalty with them. And it's not unreasonable to think that they will come to you for their future tax needs. So this is a great way to get more clients, more tax clients for the following season. Opportunity for additional services. We already talked about this a little bit, but being strategic with, do they need tax planning? Do they need tax resolution? Maybe because they filed an extension because they were afraid they owed and they end up owing. Now you can offer them some tax resolution services. Now you can offer them some tax planning services to help them maximize their tax strategy so they aren't owing in the future or as much in the future, right? They're um, strategically save on taxes. So these last minute filers can be ripe opportunity for more higher value services, okay? And then of course, I, I mentioned this on a live video, I've had extension filers that I have, I, I remember very vividly a few people that I filed an extension and I called them back as a deadline 
approached. I never heard back from them. It's suffice to say that, yeah, we lose some clients. Some clients might be dissatisfied. Some clients might have found a better rate, right? They might be like, oh, this person is going to do it for cheaper. So it's not unrealistic to think that if they file an extension with another professional that you could pick them up as a client. So don't be afraid to go after this client base and to capture your share of the market of this client base. And then last but not least is differentiating your services. So one of the ways that you can set yourself apart is by specifically going after last minute. This could be a sub niche to help you differentiate you and your marketing or you and your services with your marketing. So you can always talk about the fear of owing taxes. You can always talk about the overwhelm of preparing taxes and the fear of an audit. These can be like pillars. We go back to the psychology of the extension filer. This could be your pillars that you constantly talk about throughout your marketing throughout the year to attract these people to your business. All right, so let's talk about identifying your target market. Not only making this a part of your ongoing marketing strategy, but you can put these folks in buckets, right? So of course you have your self-employed professional. So these are your freelancers, your consultants, your independent contractors. They often have complex income streams that make their tax situation more complicated and they're typically prone to delay. So this could be one niche that you go after when you're going and you're deploying your marketing strategies. You have small business owners. Obviously, this is going to be everybody else that owns. This could be the mom and pop restaurant. This can be the landscaper, right? So a combination of these folks that manage their own finances or they deal with multiple revenue streams, they often file extensions to buy more time so that they can reconcile their accounts, gather necessary documents, and finalize their deductions. You have high net worth individuals, right? So these are your doctors and your real estate investors. They might have significant investments in like cryptocurrency, stocks and bonds. They might have multiple properties. These folks who have like complex financial portfolios, they are more likely to file an extension, right? So because they're so complex, you can focus after this specific niche. And of course, you have your partnerships and escorts. I think this is going to be pretty standard to go after. Again, they can't really file their individual tax return without that K-1 form, right? So if you go after strategically partnerships, you could pick up a lot of individual tax work as well. And then you have your nonprofit organizations. A lot of people don't go after this niche. And I'm surprised just how I just don't see a lot of people going after nonprofits. So if they're on a calendar year, their original deadline is May 15th, right? So May, June, July, August, September, October, November. So realistically, they'll have until November 15th to file if they file an extension. And so this could be another segment of the market that you strategically go after. I think it's actually one of the ones to go after, right? Because you can go to websites such as GuideStar. And you can just pull up some nonprofits in your area and you can see when's the, when the last tax return that they filed. And if you see that they are delinquent on their filings, you can prioritize reaching out to these people. So GuyStar is free, but this could be a great way to get several tax, several nonprofit tax returns. And think about it, if they have to file a nonprofit, this is in essence a separate entity or it is a separate entity from the individual or the board that manages the nonprofit. You can also potentially pick them up as well, right? You can pick up the CEO or the VP, people that sit on the board of the nonprofit. So you can start here with your basic search. So maybe you just go, I don't know, maybe you want to focus on I don't know, churches. Or let's do something more humanitarian. Let's just put that in. I'm probably going to spell it wrong. So let's see. All right. So we have 5,875 results just with the keyword humanitarian in it. So we can just look to see when the last time these nonprofits filed. So let's just pull up this one here. Let's just see where they're at. They became a nonprofit in 2013. We go to show tax forms. So really only see 2018. Yeah, that's concerning, right? 
if the last one that you see is something like 2018, so they, they are at risk of actually losing their nonprofit status. So you can have you or someone else do this, strategically go through and do like this sifting of businesses, compile an Excel spreadsheet and just start emailing them to say, hey, I really love the mission that you're doing with the Humanitarian Relief Foundation, building bridges across communities. You guys have been doing great work in the community. And so we want to offer our services for tax preparation to ensure that you keep your compliance status. So you just make this a part of your outreach process. Okay. So that's just, I just think that nonprofits can be more strategically gone after. And that was just one keyword that I use, humanitarian. You can use so many different keywords within a nonprofit niche, right? You have people that go and help schools and universities and food, children, education. There's so many different I would say niches within the nonprofit that you can go after and just incorporate this as part of your marketing outreach, right? We just want to throw out some feelers amongst all of these different types of industries to see how many clients you can actually pick up over the next couple of months before tax season. Some other strategies that you can do. So let's talk about this. One, networking. I know I've been a proponent as far as like online marketing, doing your social media marketing doing DM outreach on Instagram, on Facebook. I'm a huge proponent of that. One is the confines and comforts of your home. You don't have to do much anything besides just reach out to your folks. Taking this a step further, especially post-COVID, is going to industry associations and professional networking events, right? So one of the things that I've been doing is going to event, for example, and pulling up some professional networking events in my area. So you guys can go to Eventbrite. You can click on business and just start, maybe go to one a week, go to Eventbrite and then find some local business events that you can really meet. So I've been meeting some really amazing business owners at these local events. Like this one is 12 bucks, 90 bucks. You can find which one you want to go to, right? Los Angeles Small Business Expo. This is free. So you can start prioritizing, really getting out there once or twice a month. If you can do more, that would be great. But you will be surprised at the amount of connections that you make. And once you tell people what you do and how you help them, I'm telling you, it's like it, it, the conversion rates are just so much higher. When, so I would encourage you guys over the next couple of weeks to go to some of these networking events in your local area. Go ahead and get your LinkedIn profiles together if they already aren't, because oftentimes I prefer asking for LinkedIn. I don't do business cards, but I have had just the other day, I had somebody ask me, did I have a business card? And I was like, no, let's do LinkedIn. But they didn't have LinkedIn, which was odd, right? It was an older lady. She didn't have LinkedIn. So you do want to be mindful of that. You have different styles and different types of people that you meet. So you might want to have some business cards on you if you have some, but it's not required. Most people do have a LinkedIn and you can go ahead and pull up their profile and then reach back out to them after the event to say, hey, it was great meeting you. Just wanted to make sure you have my um, contact information. If you need any help with anything or if you know somebody that needs these services, feel free to reach out. So this is a great way to get out there honestly this week so this one is next thursday this was in a week all of these events are within the next 7 to 14 days where you can just get out and start meeting some people and telling them what you do i guarantee you you tell them what you do you're gonna get some clients <laughs> you are gonna get some clients so don't be shy guys don't be shy i know this stuff can be a little nerve-wracking because it's marketing it's a little intimidating but try not to let that deter you all right Referrals. So ask your existing clients. Maybe you send out a campaign, an email campaign to say, hey, a lot of people file an extension. And if you are one of those or if you know somebody who still needs to file their taxes, here's this offer that we have. And we'll talk more about some offers in just a second. Previous clients, make sure that if you did file an extension for a previous client, make sure you reach it back out to them. Like I said, I've lost a few extension filers. It could be for various reasons why we, their churn happens, right? You're going to lose some clients every single year. You try to mitigate that, though, and reach out and offer your services to them. Make sure that you're staying top of mind, because sometimes they might go to somebody else just because that person is in front of them at the moment. That's just who the last person that asked for their business. So it can be a little nuances on why, 
clients might go somewhere else. So you just want to mitigate that, re-engage your extension followers and then look at inactive clients, right? So on the flip side of this, I've had people that, or who hadn't come to me in a year or two, and I just happened to reach back out to them to be like, hey, we miss having you as a client. Let us know if you need help with anything. And then I actually the client back. So don't be afraid to look at your client roster year over year to see what all clients hadn't come back to you. And don't be afraid to reach back out to them to be like, hey, we miss you. We're willing to provide you some sort of promo, some sort of discount, some sort of bundle service offering to come back and let us help you again. All right. And then finally, you're online. So of course, I'm a huge proponent. LinkedIn is going to be your best friend finding your niche clients. So for example, we can go on LinkedIn, find the nonprofits. We can find any industry that you want to target for the most part on LinkedIn and you can start sending out your messaging. You also can use strategic posts on LinkedIn, right? Your LinkedIn articles and your posts that get some good engagement if thoughtful and value added. You have your Facebook groups. That's still a viable option, right? People are still congregating in Facebook groups. So posting helpful information about, are you afraid of an audit? Here's what you need to know. If you still need to file your taxes, feel free to reach out. Did you file an extension? Here's what you need to know, right? You can post some really helpful stuff in these Facebook groups to start attracting people your way. And then you can also be strategically outreaching to them, okay? And of course, Instagram is the same way. We can use our hashtags, find our niche business clients and start reaching out to them to offer your services. Now, I would say lead magnets are still really great to attract idle clients to your business. So if you create small little ebook, maybe spend about an hour, use Chat GPT to help you create the ebook, and maybe you create an extension cheat sheet for S corporations, partnerships, or niche, right? Make sure you try to make a niche specific just because we want to be targeted with the type of businesses or just the type of people in general that we want to attract to our company. But you could create a little ebook going over to how they can navigate filing their taxes at the last minute. And talk about fear of audits, talk about being overwhelmed, talk about how they can combine all of their or gather all of their documents, put a checklist in there for them so that they can help navigate all the forms that they need and all the information that they need to file their taxes. And then put that out there at the end of your Facebook post or at the end of your LinkedIn article, be like, hey, click here to download my free ebook on how X can navigate the world of last minute filing, right? Whatever you want to title it. You can use this to get leads. And now once you're on your email list, now you can market to them strategically and offer them a uh, time to book a call with you and to become a client. Ms. Fuller said I found some clients at the HOA community meeting. Yes, that's really great. Yeah, so HOA community meeting is really great. A lot of the people at and on the HOA are sometimes business owners and high net worth clients, right? They're typically doctors, lawyers, and what have you. So yeah, that's really good. Module three, so marketing strategies to secure last minute clients. So we talked about some marketing strategies already. This is just going to go over like that, that psychology with them. So make sure that when you're crafting your messaging, you are leaning into urgency and expertise, right? You're emphasizing your ability to handle the last minute tax preparation efficiently and accurately. You are positioning yourself as a stress relief, right? Like they don't have to worry about doing this. They can just hand everything over to you and you are going to take that burden off their shoulders, giving them peace of mind. You can talk about personalized service. Say you provide tailored solutions to their unique nature of their tax situation, right? Highlight your ability to provide personalized attention and customized tax strategies. Compliance and accuracy, right? People, like I said, they are afraid of being audited. They are afraid of penalties and interest. And so you can position yourself and strategically use this in your marketing on how your clients appreciate your focus on precision and your adherence to deadlines. And of course, fast turnaround, right? These people are already stressed out. They're trying to get this done quickly. So if you can promise some sort of quick results or obviously meeting the deadlines without compromising, of course, accuracy, this could be a great way to incentivize people to come to you, right? Just getting into the psychology. That's what you guys need to remember. You just want to get into their mind frame and use their fears 
to help you reach the people who you need to reach so you can come in and save the day for them. So talking about some outreach techniques. So we social media posts, let's say you can go to Fiverr, go to Upwork, have somebody create these last minute filing posts for you, get them nice and branded and start posting them on social media. Like I said, you can hire somebody if you don't want to do it yourself. You can hire somebody to create these LinkedIn articles that you can also turn into videos and post these videos on the various social media channels. But pretty much we're going to take all this psychology that we know that they are dealing with, their mind frame and their desires, and we're going to turn this into strategic social media posts. We're going to turn this into your email campaigns, and we're going to turn this into your referral outreach, right? Do you know someone who still needs to file their taxes? If you refer them, you can offer some sort of discount. I used to offer $35. You can offer more or less. And you'd be surprised how many people are motivated to, to send more people your way because they are getting incentives. And I would pay it out immediately. As soon as I got a referral, I'll text them. Cash out really wasn't big when I was doing this. So I would actually say, hey, come pick up this $35. Now we have so many different ways to send people money, right? Cash out, then Moselle. So you can say and provide these incentives for people to refer clients to you and just get creative on what that looks like and make sure that you're comfortable with it. You can run Facebook and Instagram ads, right? Going back to that ebook, I will highly encourage you to maybe run 50 bucks, see how it goes to a specific, maybe you focus on your local area, right? Maybe you focus on a very specific demographic and run that ebook to that specific demographic or your local area and get some leads in, right? You can use this to amplify the leads that you get. Instagram stories and reels. Of course, Instagram and LinkedIn and TikTok is going to be a great way to get clients. I always call it bittersweet because we're tech pros, we're accountants, we're bookkeepers. We're not really trying to be in front of the camera all day long, but it's a necessary strategy to do because it does get you clients, right? It puts you in front of your idle clients. It puts you top of mind. It positions you as the expert, as the authority. So it does work. So if you can maybe dedicate one hour out of your week and just batch some content, that would be helpful just so you at least are posting consistently throughout the week and sharing and engaging with your network. Emails. So how you want to look at emails, you just want to segment, like I said, go after inactive people who hadn't gone to you or who hadn't been back to you from a particular tax year. Make sure you hit up your clients that did file an extension with you. And then make sure you hit up everybody else to say, hey, we are so happy to serve you this year. Unfortunately, there's still people that need to file. And if you know somebody who still needs to file, we are giving out $20 Starbucks gift cards, whatever the case may be, if you refer someone to us. So you have those three segments that you can reach out to with your email list. Now we talked about networking, right? Reach out to your network. So we talked about going out, meeting people, going to event, maybe going to one or two events per month. If you could do more, great. What you want to consider is you have other professionals in your network that you can reach out to and ask them to be in partnership with you, right? We call this your lateral partners. So if real estate agents, real estate brokers, mortgage officers, financial advisors, bankers, at least types of people, reach out to them to say, hey, there's still a lot of businesses and individuals that if you know anyone, let's create some sort of reciprocity where we can be of mutual benefit. I can send you clients, you can send me clients. Don't be afraid to reach out to your network. Don't be afraid to let them know how you can help them too, right? Because they're looking for business. Everybody is looking for business. So get into partnership, get into community with other professionals and see how you can make it a reciprocal relationship. And of course, those local business events, professional meetups. Like I said, I went to a local business event the other day and met some really amazing people in the greater Los Angeles area that are like shakers and movers. And I've never been that type of person to, I don't know, networking was always intimidating for me. But now it's exciting because it's, man, you never know who you meet going to these events and who's who, right? A lot of the most successful people are not like big on social media, like the people that I met 
the other day are some very successful people. But when I pull them up on LinkedIn, on Instagram, they have a couple of hundred followers. It's crazy. So we can't tell them online. We can't see how big they are because that's not the type of medium that they choose or that they chose to promote their business. They have different avenues, right? Or they might have different contracts, government contracts, or maybe they go enterprise, right? They serve bigger corporations, so they don't need a big social media presence like that. But you'll be surprised how many real life professional and successful people you meet out going to these small events, popping your head in, working the room real quick. You don't have to stay, <laughs> work the room, meet people, give value, right? Giving value means once you know what somebody does, how can you immediately offer them some sort of nugget, right? Some sort of gem that can help them win in their business. Don't be afraid to do that because people start to look at you as the connect, right? They start looking at you as a value add. If you know that you have a client that can utilize somebody else's services who you met out at a networking event or who you know in your uh, sphere of influence, make the connection. Send up an email just either right now. You could think about, you can look at your phone, pull somebody out of your phone, right? So let me try to do this in, in real time. I can go in my phone. Find somebody who I haven't connected with in a while. Okay, so I find, I see an individual. This is a business owner that has space, event space in the greater Los Angeles area. The gentleman that I met the other night, he does activations. He does events. So I can do a quick email to be like, hey, name, here's this person has event space. You have activations that you're planning for the remainder of the year. I thought it would be good for you guys to know each other. When you do that, people subconsciously look at you as the business connector. You're the networker. You're the broker to pull people together. And it does something amazing. It activates the law of reciprocity. So now they want to look out for you. And now you're top of mind to them. You can connect people in that way. And I'm learning now how to do this, right? But it feels good because you're like, man, I just connected people who I know could benefit. Even if they don't work together, you going out and planting the seed is what's needed for them to want to reciprocate and have your back as well. So don't be afraid to connect people. You can do this right now and make five connections to people that you think that they should just know each other because there's some synergy or there could be some alignment there. Watch how that opens up the door for more business for you. All right. Okay. Now, last couple of things I'm going to talk about is bundling your services. We talk about how to stand out from the competition. We talked about discounts and promos. Yes, that's one way. One of my favorite ways is actually bundling your services. So you can offer them a tax prep plus financial review, right? So you will also add in a financial review or planning session for a single price. So this adds value and it encourages clients to choose your service. You can offer a compliance package. So yes, this is going to include their last minute tax filing. It's also going to include a review of their past tax returns and future tax planning. So this is going to position you as the person that they can go to for long-term compliance and tax planning services. But then of course you have your referral incentive bundles. This is where you offer the discount or additional service to both the referrer and the referred client. This could help spark that word of mouth. Not only they might find it beneficial if you say, hey, you refer people to us for this compliance, we'll give you X amount of tax planning services for free or in exchange. But you can't play with your services like this if you don't want to do something by cash or a Starbucks card or Amazon card, something like that. You can get creative with what you offer people who refer business your way. Okay. So let's talk about closing the deal. So this is, all of this is building up to getting the client. So you know who you're going to go after, their psychology, their mindset, and even why they have an extension. You understand the pain points that you're going to go after. You understand the niches that you want to tackle. You understand how you're going to do it, right? You're going to use a combination of in-person and online strategies. Now, when you get them in, you just want to make sure that you're having your strategy sessions perfectly, right? So make sure that you are being empathetic, your understanding of their situation, showcase your expertise by mentioning other clients who you worked with successfully, right? How you helped them meet tight deadlines, how you helped them save on taxes with XX strategies like tax planning and tax compliance. You always want to be transparent and direct. So make sure they know what your process looks like. 
So again, I, I use this analogy all the time. When you get on an airplane, the air pilot comes on. He's, hey, we're going to this city or this country. Here's the weather over there. We might experience some turbulence, but no worries, blah, blah, blah. They give you the lay of the land and it makes you relax more. So if you do experience that turbulence, you're less frightened because you're like, oh, okay. He said, oh, we were going to have some turbulence. Let your clients know this too. Let them know what your process looks like, what they can expect. So as they're working with you and going through the process, if there's any kinks that might come up, you've already pre-positioned them or predisposed them to some hiccups that could occur, right? So you just want to make sure that they have a lay of the land. And of course, active listening. Pay attention to their concerns, their questions. Make sure that you are reiterating back to them what they need. A lot of times, and I probably... Maybe a couple of times a year, I have somebody email me. They'll be like, hey, Krista, I got this issue with this client. They're trying to sue me. Like just that the customer is really dissatisfied and they're asking for my assistance. And when I look at the situation, it's always very similar reasons on why these clients get to that point. And it's only because there was a miscommunication. So make sure that as you're talking to these people that you are reiterating, if I heard you right, you need this, that. And make sure that you are following up with your email, with your engagement letter, because this is how you mitigate issues that can become pretty costly, such as lawsuits and litigation, just by reiterating what they said that they needed and wanted from you. Okay, now let's go over some objections. You might have somebody that's concerned about the cost. So you can say, listen, I understand that cost is a concern. Given the urgency, I offer flexible pricing options and we can discuss the plan that fits your budget while ensuring you receive the quality services that you need. So let me know what type of budget do you have or what was your budget for this? Don't be afraid to ask that question. If they have a doubt about meeting the deadline, you can say, hey, I've helped many clients in similar situations and we have a proven process for managing tight deadlines. In fact, I have a team of people that we work with and that I entrust and we make sure that we get your tax filing on time. If they worry about the quality, you can say, listen, time is of the essence, but we can guarantee that we never compromise accuracy and thoroughness. We use XX tools and systems to ensure both timely and filing for your tax return. And then last, fear of IRS penalties. Your response can be, we understand this is always a common fear, but filing late can indeed lead to penalties. So if we work together now, we can minimize those risks by getting you compliant and submit it within the remaining time frame. So just understand that you're going to come up against some sort of objections. And it's every question is technically an objection, honestly. So if they're asking you a question, they're asking you the question because this is something that is on their mind that could be a deal breaker for them. So don't be afraid to tackle these objections head on and be prepared to respond, especially if you're on the phone with them. Now, wrapping all this up, you just want to make sure that you have your streamlined onboarding, you have your engagement letters ready, you have your workflow process, how you're actually going to tackle. Because listen, if you go out and do all these marketing strategies, you're, you're going to get some clients. So just make sure that you yourself, you have a process that you are working with so that you get every client's work done on time. You get that extension file on time because we know it's typically not another extension that you're gonna be able to apply for. So make sure that you're managing your time effectively. Some other things that you can do to help manage your time, you can batch similar, similar tasks together. It's not uncommon for a lot of pros to prepare taxes on certain days just because it's super hard to prepare a tax return, and then break your focus and start doing some marketing. It's hard to go back because you're using your analytical side and then your creative side. So the best way is to plan the, the days and times in which you're going to do taxes and which you're going to talk to clients and which you're going to do your marketing. This is just going to help you manage your mental health better. Make sure that you're delegating. Don't be afraid to delegate and to give your team tasks. If you don't have a team, delegate the tasks that are just tedious for you. Like, for example, you might want to delegate the nonprofit thing that I was going over with GuideStar. You might have somebody pay them 50 bucks and say, hey, I need a list of 500 nonprofits that haven't filed their taxes for 23 and 22. They pay somebody to do that for you. 
this is what I'm saying, just leveraging your time appropriately and outsourcing the things that aren't high value, that, that are important, but that are tedious, that you don't have to do yourself. You also can give priority to high value clients. So obviously, if it's a bigger type business, if they have more revenue, if they have more employees, you might want to give priority to those folks if and when possible. And then you, of course, want to make sure that you tackle all of your tasks in a systematic way. So if it's something that's complex, if you have a, a partnership that's following their tax return and they have 50 partners and then you have an individual that just have two real estate properties, you might want to tackle the more complex task first, get it out the way so that you aren't spending all your time at the last minute trying to get these more complex followers completed. Quality control is important. So make sure you are double checking your work, right? Because this is the last minute and you're going to be doing marketing and campaigns and getting last minute clients in, make sure you have a quality control process. So use a checklist for each tax return. Make sure that everything is consistent. Everything is accurate. Utilize your automated calculations within your software to help you cross-reference data. Use a quality control process. The last thing you want to do is get several businesses and high net worth individuals in your tax practice and it's wrong, right? And then now you create a negative experience for your clients, all right? All right, guys. So listen, what questions do you have? We have about four more minutes. But what questions do you guys have? And like I said, I'll post this replay in a few hours for those that had to hop off or those that couldn't join. Let me know what questions do you guys have. Okay. Have a good Thank one, guys. Bye-bye.